All right, open your Bibles, if you will, to um, Daniel chapter 1. Again, familiar passage of Scripture, but it says this. It says, uh, in the third year of uh, the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with the part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the minister of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom uh, they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and the wine which he drank, so... uh, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and unto Hananiah of Shadrach, and unto Mishael of, uh, yeah, Mishael of Meshach, and unto Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel in favor with tender love with the prince of the eunuchs, and the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzer, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this manner and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar uh, took away the portion of their meat and wine that they should drink, and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said should should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before uh, before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them. Among them was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom... And understanding that the king inquired of them, they found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even to the first year of King Cyrus. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, what you've done for us uh, here today. And Father, in our lives, you're a great and a mighty God. And once again, we come back to a familiar passage of Scripture where we see how that you have um, taken care of your servants and provided for them in ways that uh, in earthly Uh, In an earthly uh, sense, Father, we never could have done for ourselves. I pray that you had set me aside here this morning and just use a few of these items uh, out of your word that would minister to the hearts of your people. Uh, Father, again, we thank you for a place to be and certainly ask that you bless uh, the day and the the rest of the uh, events here later on after service. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, I told you it was locked. You know what? That's all right. Never mind. Come on in, Seth. Thanks. Now, and the reason I said that is every now and then my car locks itself. <laughs> I didn't intentionally lock it, although that would have been funny. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> all right, let's get back on course here, book of, uh, of Daniel. So it says in uh, 2 Kings, just to kind of get the, the setting and the stage for where we're at, and I will try to hurry, and that's never going to work, but I'll try. It came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, this is back during the time uh, when Nebuchadnezzar is coming in and seizing, besieging Jerusalem, in the tenth month and the tenth day of the month that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his host against Jerusalem and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about. Uh, the city was besieged unto the eleventh year, so that's two years, folks, two years Nebuchadnezzar sieged. And uh, the army was surrounding Jerusalem, and those Jews were stuck in that army, or stuck in that city, and they couldn't get out. Two years. 
Now, there was no bread by the time this was all said and done. Two years, those Jews had been held up inside Jerusalem, and the Nebuchadnezzar and his army was out there, and they were stuck. And food started running out, and water started running out, and they killed every animal that was in the city. Before you know it, the animals all ran out. And let me tell you something, folks. They were getting hungry. You got that, right? I mean, they were down to their last, you know, probably their last scrap of, uh, you know, dove's dung they ate in a, uh, another place in the Bible. But they were down to the last of nothing, I'm sure, before they ever decided to give up to King Nebuchadnezzar. It was a long, drawn-out, miserable existence. Two years. Listen, sometimes you guys get hungry or sometimes I get hungry if I go two hours without eating. Much less two days. Two weeks is almost unthinkable. Can you imagine two years of living and consisting on virtually nothing? Right? That's where they're at. I mean, I, I wonder what they look like. Just their physical appearance after two years of living like that in that condition. You see, the, uh, you, know, you see the pictures of some of the concentration camps. It had to have been getting pretty close to that before they gave up. We're not talking, oh, gee, this was a convenient time for Daniel and his friends to stand up and, and make a stand for their God. Daniel and his friends were in the city for two years starving before this whole thing in Daniel chapter 1 ever took place. That's pretty amazing. Now, hunger can drive a man to make some pretty terrible decisions along the way, amen? I mean, I've seen some of the things that people eat when they're hungry. Uh, those are bad decisions, <laughs> right? But you know, spiritual hunger sometimes can drive us to make some pretty bad decisions as well, amen? You gotta be careful when the devil gets you in a place where spiritually you're really, 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 really hungry. Because if you're not careful, you'll eat almost anything. That's true. Amen? Amen? And these, uh, these Jews had been in Jerusalem for two years, and their they're they're, they're struggle for survival, their struggle for just existence day to day, uh, was more than you can even comprehend. So Daniel and his, his, two, or his three friends are sitting there. Next thing you know, Nebuchadnezzar comes in. They take care of King uh, Zedekiah. If you remember right, they took uh, King Zedekiah and they killed his sons right before his eyes. I mean, we're not talking about a pleasant situation here. This whole thing set up to the Daniel chapter 1. They kill King Zedekiah's sons right before his eyes. And then they take you know, something and they put his eyes out. So that the last thing that he ever saw on this earth was them killing his boys. Now we get to Daniel chapter 1. And Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are sitting there and they're brought in and they're given, you know, they're given uh, over to, uh, to Melzar and, and Ashpenaz, the, the, you know, the director of the eunuchs, and they've got all those, those people over there, and they're, the king's given them charge. Take care of them. Feed them. We're going we're gonna to choose out the best and see if we can make something of them. And in that, in that reprieve, if you want to call it that, for Daniel and his three friends, they finally get food. You understand, two years, I wonder how much they weighed. After two years of living under a besiegement there in Jerusalem, I bet those folks were starving. And they finally get a chance to have food. And they bring that food in before Daniel and his three friends. And Daniel stands up in uh, verse 8. Daniel stands up. It had to have been the first time they had a meal. I mean, it doesn't specifically say that, but I don't think Daniel went for a couple weeks eating it and then did all of a sudden developed a conviction about not eating the king's meat. Two years under siege, two years of starvation, two years of, of just barely, barely surviving, and then they finally get a meal, and now Daniel's put to the test. And he stands up, and it says this. It says, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Now, brethren, that's some pretty high ground for a Christian walk, isn't it? 
two years of starvation. You see what's happened to your people. You've seen what's happened to your friends, your family. And, and you're, you are about ready to eat any bug that crawls on the ground. You're so desperately hungry. They bring you into the new place. They set you down the king's table. And they bring in all this luscious food. And your religious conviction is going to stand under those conditions? Really? It did for Daniel. It did for Daniel. Daniel said this. It says, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. That, that's some pretty high ground. I titled this message this morning very simply, A Decision Against Defilement. Amen? A Decision Against Defilement. Now, many of you remember that movie, uh, Chariots of Fire. How many of you remember that? Real quick, show of hands. It's, okay, a good number of you. But basically, um, it was a, a movie written about an actual event, about Herrick, uh, Eric, I'm sorry, Eric Henry uh, Lindell. And he was a, uh, a Scotsman. Back in the 1920s, he lived from 1902 to 1945, and the movie was based upon some decisions that he made in the 1929 Olympics. He ran, um, he ran for Europe and or for Britain in 1929 Olympics, and you remember the course of the story. I mean, he was noted for uh, what? He was noted for he was an Olympic athlete, and he was noted for standing up and refusing to run on a Sunday because that particular event that he was favored in to be the Olympic gold medal was held on a Sunday. And he stood up and said, no, I'm not going to run on a Sunday. That's quite the conviction. I mean, at that level, he's, you know, he stood up on, on something that was pretty major. And listen... He, he said, like Daniel, I'm not going to be defiled by the king's meat. Now, what you may not know about him is that his parents were missionaries to China. This is actually Eric. Eric. His parents were missionaries to China and had, had uh, served... Uh, in China for a number of years. He, Eric himself, was born in China while his parents were on the mission field. When he was about five years old, they actually sent him back to, uh, to Europe to go to school. He lived and grew up and, and went to school, which is where he started his athletic career. And then after he, after he graduated school, after he went through the Olympics, the whole thing about chariots of fire, this gentleman goes back to China and becomes a missionary himself until he dies. This guy lives and dies in China. Daniel said, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Listen, his, that, that devo he took great devotion for him to do that. He stood up, and he didn't want to defile himself with an old... He said, he said, you know, I won't run on the Sabbath. And again, you and I, we understand some things about the Old Testament that, that maybe theologically he didn't have down straight. You and I know that under the New Testament, we're not necessarily commanded to keep the Sabbath like the Old Testament Jews were, were, uh, were ordered to keep. Amen? And we got that conviction, and we understand that, and we have that knowledge, and we have liberty that, that he didn't, uh, you know, didn't comprehend. But you have to admit, the principle of standing up and doing something or not doing something for God is pretty lofty heights. Amen. It's a principle that, you know, that we should, should emulate. I mean, I am, I am so glad, to be perfectly honest with you, that we don't have to live under the Old Testament uh, rules and regulations that, that were back there. Uh, I am glad that we don't have to uh, worry about the Sabbath. I'm glad that we don't have to worry about the holy days. Can you, I, wouldn't, I would forget them. I mean, inevitably, I would forget something. Just, 
<laughs> right? You guys, you know what I'm talking about. You'd forget it too. Uh, I'm glad that we don't have to follow the dietary restrictions. I tell you what, I had some shrimp the other day. I like shrimp. Amen. <laughs> I am really grateful and thankful for the liberty that I have because I can eat shrimp. And bacon, oh, let's just go. Uh, I love bacon. Right? I don't know how you could live without bacon. I think it's probably ungodly. I'm just kidding, teasing. But uh, every Baptist's favorite verse, we all know it in Acts, right? When the Lord's talking to Peter, he's, there came a voice unto him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Right? We love that verse. And, um, and Peter said, not so, Lord. No, 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 wait. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the Lord says in the next verse, the Lord spake to him a second time, what God hath cleansed, what God hath cleansed, that call thou, not thou uncommon. Amen? Amen? I am so thankful the Lord cleansed shrimp. <laughs> I am. I really am. I'm great. And if you don't like shrimp, it doesn't matter, right? We have liberty. You can eat it or not eat it. It doesn't make a bit of difference. But I'm glad that I can. But Daniel, Daniel and his friends stood up back then, and they were under a little different scenario. They were under some Old Testament rules where they really didn't have that option. We have the option. We can eat it or not eat it, whatever we choose. Either way is okay. Paul said, doesn't matter if you do, doesn't matter if you don't. If somebody doesn't like it, get over it. It's their problem, not yours. Right? I mean, be careful because you don't want to offend your brother, but we have that liberty. So I don't have to worry about defiling myself with some of those Old Testament regulations that Daniel and his friends had to defile himself with, or had to worry about defiling himself with. But there are some things in the New Testament that I do have to worry about defiling myself with. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 3 real quick. Keep your finger in Daniel because we'll go back there. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15 says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. All right, so I know this. I know I need, I need to worry about defiling the temple of God. Amen all right, well, what is that? Because obviously it's not eating shrimp or something of that nature, right? So, so what is that? Take a look at verse 3. For ye are carnal, for whereas there is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? That's the context getting down into that passage. You know what I have to worry about in, in this life, what you and I have to worry about when it comes to defilement, listen, we have to worry about striving in the wrong places. Amen? Amen? We got to worry now, everybody understands you need to strive to live right for God, strive to do the things that are holy and good and right, but we have to worry, you and I have to worry about striving in a manner that can defile us. It says there in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, it says, for ye are yet carnal, whereas there is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are you not carnal? And then it goes on and talks about defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost. Striving. We have to worry about those things. Listen. It lists three things in there that I've got to worry about in connection with defiling my temple. Now, Daniel, after two years of starvation when presented with a nice big meal, stood up and said, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not going to defile myself with the king's meat. Amen. You know what our goal is? I mean, we, we count Daniel as a hero of the faith. Yeah. You know what our goal ought to be in our Christian life? Is to stand up after whatever turmoil we've been through and say, you know what, I am not going to defile this temple of the Holy Ghost by striving when I don't need to strive. Amen? I'm not going to defile this, this temple of the Holy Ghost by these three things that are listed here in 1 Corinthians 3 by envying. What is envying? It is, I looked it up, definition. It's painful or resentful awareness 
of an advantage enjoyed by another. How come he's got that? How come, how come they're not in the same situation I'm in? How come the Lord seemed to give that person a better lot in life than me? Amen? It is, it is painful or resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by another joined with a desire to possess the same advantage. Envy. Say, what do, we have to, what do we have to watch out for when it comes to defilement? We got to worry about striving in the wrong places. Amen. And one of the things that will get us into that location is envy. Right? Have you ever, have you ever been on either the, the giving or receiving end of envy? It does wild things to you. It, 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 it turns you upside down. It turns your thinking all around. What does that do to you and I as a Christian? I tell you what it does. It, it defiles our temple, right? It defiles our temple. Uh, strife is constant or, uh, you know, a frequent state of animosity towards others, especially another Christian. Think about it that way. The, uh, the definition is a bitter, sometimes violent conflict or dissension disagreement right division what's division division is like um, uh, it's like a, a click I like you but I don't like you right you find something we find something in in, in somebody else's life to, to divide over to, to you know separate that should not be there those are the things I have to worry about when it comes to defilement See, for me as a Christian, it doesn't matter what I eat or don't eat. I'm good either way. But the things that I have to worry about have a tendency to be a little more internal rather than external. It's really easy, folks, to manage Christianity on an external level. All I got to do is get some nice clothes. I can put on a suit, right? I can have my wife pick out a tie that matches. That was funny, right? I can put on a good face, right? I don't, but I'm, some of you put on makeup, okay? Uh, I can comb my hair. I can, you know, use deodorant, all those things to, to, to make the outside look really good and still miss the boat. When it comes to the New Testament and Christianity, walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, the things that we have to worry about when it comes to defilement are not external like we see in the Old Testament a lot of times. When Paul starts dealing with us, when the Bible starts dealing with us as New Testament Christians, he starts dealing with things that are much closer than we really like to admit. He deals with our inside. Two years of starvation. Big meal presented in front of Daniel, uh, Ananiah, Hazari, and Mishael. And, and they stand up, and Daniel says, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat. How hungry sometimes do we have to get before we allow ourselves to be defiled by something out there? It's probably not two years worth of starvation, right? See, our, our, our goal, our goal is to avoid the, def the defilement. Our goal is like Daniel to stand up and be strong and, and take the stand. Eric, uh, Eric stood up during those, that 1929 Olympics, and I know the movie had it that he found out, you know, late in the plane on the way over. He actually knew a, a few months ahead of time that, what the schedule was. He actually had, I think it was about three or four months to think about it and ponder it. And don't you know the devil was bantering him back and forth in that decision. You know, should I, right? And he stood his ground and decided, I'm not going to do this because I don't want to defile myself. And I'm not even making an argument whether he was theologically correct or not, because in all frankness, 
it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. I'm saying the Lord convicted him. And like Daniel, having this great banquet in front of him of, of you know, potential victory and glory and honor, and he stood firm to a principle that the Lord was dealing with him about. The things that we struggle with are internal. Right? The things that you and I struggle with are, are internal. Listen, I better hurry. Wow, I really better hurry. We need to choose our fights carefully, but envying, strife, and divisions are one way that we can defile the temple. Take a look at Hebrews uh, uh, chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Another uh, area of defilement that we have to face in the New Testament. It says this in Hebrews 12. Looking diligently, lest any man fall, uh, fail excuse me, of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Thereby many be defiled. It says there, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. See, Daniel and, and, his, uh, you know, Daniel and his friends had two years to sit back and watch this process happen. And they were stuck. They had no options. They just had to take the starvation. They had to long for food. How many nights they lay their head on the, on the pillow just wishing for, I don't know, some corn, some rice, some whatever to eat, some beans. Eric had to sit for months going up to that Olympic event in 1929, thinking to himself, am I doing the right thing? Am I holding out? Am I standing up for the right principle? Am I picking the right fight? Is this something worth losing a, a gold medal over? And Daniel and his three friends stood up, and they purposed in their heart not to defile themselves with a the king's meat. Eric stood up, and he chose not to defile himself with something the Lord was convicting him on. See, when it comes to our, our Christian walk being defiled, the things that we're defiled by are inside. Envy. Strife, right? Here's another one. Bitterness. How often does that come up? It's just, it's easy. It happens all the time. How about, how about having the same purpose that Daniel had? To stand up and say, I will not be defiled by this. I will not be defiled by envy. I'll not be defiled by striving. I'll not be defiled by bitterness. I won't let the devil put me in a situation where maybe for years there's been a shortage of something that I desperately need and then throw the defilement in front of me and give me an opportunity to take it. See, that's what the devil likes to do. He likes to shortchange you on what you think you need and then throw a corrupt version in front of you so that you'll reach out and grab it. Why? Because you're hungry. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were hungry. And they got to that king's table, and that had to have been one banquet. And sitting there emaciated, they had to sit there at that table and look at that food and go, oh, Lord. It would be so good to just give a little bit right now. It would be so good to just let a little bit of the defilement come in. And then we can go back to our principles next week. <laughs> right? After I'm full. But they didn't do that. High ground. See, that's our, that's our calling. That's our, ground. That's, our, that's our goal. Right? We look at Daniel as a hero of the faith. Why? It's not because what he did was easy. It's because what he did was hard. But he did it. He stepped up to the plate. Right? That's what makes him the hero. 
It says there in, in that verse, when, when you start uh, looking at this kind of defilement, right? Looking diligently, lest any man uh, fail of the grace of God. Lest any man fail of the grace of God. You know how you start the defilement process here in, in Hebrews? You, you lose sight of, the, of grace. You lose sight of having grace with one another. I mean, I, I'm thankful that we're in a, a church where that doesn't happen on a regular basis. I know every one of us slips up every now and then. I get it. But folks, in, in general, you guys do very well. But it's, it's one of those things that the devil, you know, the devil would like to keep you starved from for a while and then throw this banquet in front of your face. And if you're not careful, it springs up in front of you and we jump on it. Right? What is it that we have to watch for? Losing sight of grace. Just losing grace with one another. Right? Losing charity with one another. Losing, losing that heartfelt compassion for one another. You say, what is that? It's the road to defilement in the New Testament. Outside, everything may look just fine. Inside is what we're worried about. Amen. Right? You lose sight of grace, bitterness arises. Next thing you know, you're the one that's troubled. It said, looking diligently, lest any man should fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you, thereby many be defiled. That tells me this. It tells me it's going to happen a lot more than we really care to admit. Right? Thereby many be defiled. I've got to watch. I've got to be careful. Listen, striving is, is a defilement that I have to watch out for as a New Testament Christian walking in, our li in this life. Um, I have to watch out for my spirit being defiled by, by these types of things, by bitterness, by losing, uh, losing sight of grace, by being troubled. David said in Psalm 77, he said, In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be, my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and I was troubled. I complained. My spirit was overwhelmed. David lost sight of it for a little while there. Amen? David walked on that line of letting defilement come in for a little while there. Right? Even King David. I'll hurry. Listen, not only do you have to worry about uh, defilement coming from, from striving, incorrect striving, right? Envying, strife, those sort of things. Not only do you have to worry about defilement coming and, and ruining your spirit. You start looking at things the wrong way. You start looking at it bitter. You lose grace. Your, your, your spirit, the way you think, the way you operate with people, the way you deal with people gets all you know, twisted around. Right? Those are the defilements we have to worry about. But there's a, another one. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8, 7. Another way that you and I can be defiled if we're not careful as a, as a Christian how be it, in verse, 1 Corinthians 8, how be it there is not every man, in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Listen, not only, not only do we defile ourselves because of striving in the wrong, in the wrong ways, not only can we be defiled in our spirit because we lose track of grace, we let bitterness set in, all those other emotional things that, that tend to come along with that, but we can be defiled, brethren, because we become overly sensitive about our convictions. Amen? Amen? We can be defiled and, and mess up our walk as a Christian because we let our convictions get out of whack. Either A... We go against them. We know, hey, listen, the Lord's been dealing with me about this, and I've been struggling with it, and I keep falling, and I, I stand back up, and he brushes me off, and life is good, and I just, you know, I keep falling back. He's, he's, he's on me all the time about it, and we can defile ourselves because we just choose not to be a Daniel, right? 
We can also defile ourselves with our, our convictions because we you know, take those and impose them on somebody else. And pride gets in the way and we think, huh, right? What do they say the, the difference between a, um, you know, a, a Pharisee and a, a liberal is? Somebody's got one more conviction than you or one less conviction than you, <laughs> right? Listen, we have to worry, we have to worry about, we have to worry about uh, the defilement coming inside and a lot of times it revolves around, it revolves around things that we're, we're sensitive about, about our convictions, about our conscience. We let, we let our conscience dictate some defilements that shouldn't ought to be there. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Oh, I'm sorry, I read the wrong verse. It says, uh, howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered to an idol. The Lord's dealing with us about it. We know the Lord's dealing with us about it. There's no question about it, but we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. We defile our conscience, right? And their conscience being weak is defiled. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he, says, he said this, he said, for our rejoicing, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. He said, you know what? When the struggles came, when the trials came, when that meal was presented before me at King Nebuchadnezzar's table after I was starving for two years, he said, you know what? I have a clean conscience because I was able to push back and say, I purpose in my heart not to be defiled with the king's meat. You know what Paul counted that as? A rejoicing. You know what you'll find if you purpose in your heart? Just, just pick one thing, all right? We're human. It takes time. We walk. Just pick one thing and say, you know what? I am going to purpose in my heart in this one area not to be defiled by the king's meat. And you know what? Every time you make a little bit of progress in that area, you'll rejoice like Paul did. You'll say, praise the Lord. I got through another day without it. I got through another day with it, whatever it is, right? What are you doing? You're doing what Daniel and those three Hebrew children did. You're pushing yourself back from the king's table. You say, yeah, but I fail every now and then. Huh, welcome to the club, because if that's the measure of success, then I'm a failure. Because every now and then I fail too. But we're talking about what things defile us in the New Testament, and they're all, it's what makes it so stinking hard. It's easy to fix the outside. In a Christian life, it's easy to fix the outside. All you got to do is dress up and pretend like everything's going good. Nobody knows any different. It is much more difficult to fix the inside, because you know what? That's between you and God. And nobody else really matters what they think. I mean, they may be affected, I get it, but it doesn't really matter what they think. That's between you and God. Amen. And the Lord gives us that, that desire to push back from the king's table so that we don't defile ourselves. Again, I'll have to, have to hurry. Listen, you're... Defilement in the New Testament. We talked about uh, uh, three of them already. Striving you're in your spirit, like, uh, you know, your... Your thoughts, losing grace with one another, uh, bitterness, your sensitivities, your convictions, those things can, def can be a defilement to us as New Testament Christians. Obviously, another one that we run across all the time is, is our speech. You know the story in Matthew, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth defileth the man. Right? It's a New Testament Christian. We have to watch what comes out of our mouth. Why? Because it comes from inside, in our heart. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah for two years lived under besiegement of Nebuchadnezzar, starving. And when they had held out as long as they could, 
when their rations were, were divvied up as, into as small a portions as they could, and they, they subsisted on them for as long as they possibly could, and there was nothing left, and Zedekiah finally says, okay, guys, we've done all we can. And he knows the consequences are not going to be good for him. He watches his sons get killed, then his eyes get put, put out, then he gets hauled over to Babylon. Amen. And then finally, this whole besiege is supposed to be over. Nebuchadnezzar chooses out the choicest, the best, among whom is Daniel and his three friends. And he says, I'm going to take care of these guys. Brings them in, sets them at the table. And even then, Daniel stands up and says, no. I'm just not going to defile myself. I'm just not going to defile myself. Man, I wish I had some more of that in me, amen? I wish I had some more of that in me. Every now and then, I, I see a glimmer of it. You know, it's kind of distant and faded in the background. I see it. It's a great goal to shoot for. But we should strive for it. We should strive for it. We know the speech, how that plays and how things that come out of our mouth are really a reflection of what's in, in our heart. We're talking now about, in the New Testament, different ways that you and I can be defiled. Again, we're not dealing with outside stuff, we're dealing with inside stuff. Striving, spirit, sensitivities, our speech. But it's our goal to try to stay undefiled. It's our, our, our aim, our goal should be to stay undefiled. Eric went on after the Olympics. He wound up meeting a young lady, got married. Him and his wife were missionaries. They had two kids. His wife was pregnant with a third kid when things in China got really bad. The Japanese came in, were occupying it. He sent his wife, pregnant wife, and his other two daughters home back to, well, to Canada. And he stayed on the mission field. His brother was at a mission site. His brother was a missionary. Was at a doctor at a mission site. And his brother's health was so bad that he needed to go home, went home. His, and Eric went and took over his place at that mission site. And the Japanese came in, and he wound up, he wound up dying there, that intern camp. I think it was 1943, if I remember right, 43 or 45. This is a guy that when he had the chance at the gold medal, his, his desire not to be defiled was more important. And of course, you know the story, right? He couldn't run the, the 200 meter race because that, or he chose not to run the 200 meter race because that was on Sunday. He decided to run the 400 meter, which he was laughed at. Nobody thought that he would even come close because his best time wasn't any, it was mediocre up at that level. And what does he do? He goes and he takes the gold medal in the 400. Amen. Right? Amen. Don't you know the Lord honored him for doing that? Amen. He changes that thing around his, I mean, just like Daniel, right? Daniel and the three uh, Hebrew children, they stood up and they said, we'll not, we're purpose in our heart not to defile ourselves with the king's meat. You see, it's worth, it's worth staying undefiled. Psalm 119 says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Brethren, it is worth, kids, young ones, listen, it is worth staying undefiled. The Lord takes care of his saints when they stand up and just try to be a Daniel and say, you know what? I am not going to defile myself with fill in the blank, the king's meat, whatever it is. Eric ran that 400 meter. He was, he was not favored. He was laughed at and scorned, ridiculed because of how he ran the whole nine yards. He watched out there and he takes a gold medal in that event. He goes back to China as a missionary he spends the rest of his, his life as a, as a missionary. 
Somebody asked him one time, they said, uh, oh, I forgot this. Before the race, that 400 that he was laughed at, one of the other competitors walks up and hands him a slip of paper. And he opens it up and he reads it. It was on the morning of that 400 meter final in uh, July of 1924. And the message said this, it says, in the old book, it says, he that honors me will I honor, wishing you the best of success always. There's another Christian who walked up, knew what Eric was doing, handed him this slip of paper, wishing him the best. Isn't that something? That's incredible. That's incredible. He was, he was asked um, on one occasion if he ever regretted his decision not to run in that 200-meter race. And he responded this way. He said, it's natural for a chap to think over all, all of that sometimes, but I'm glad at the work I'm engaged in now. A fellow's life counts far more at this than the other. He never got, to saw, never got to see his third daughter. He died over in, in China. Don't you know at the judgment seat of Christ, whew, oh man, we sing that song, right? It will be worth it all. You see, Daniel and his three Hebrew, Hebrew friends had to worry about some defilement that was very evident, very external, very outside. They knew what to do, and they stood up against it. You and I as Christians have to worry about some things on the inside. But we're called just as equally to stand up against those things as Daniel and his three friends were called to stand up against the king's meat. Amen? Listen, you know, they, uh, they made a monument to Eric on the grounds of that internment camp. His stand, his desire just to not partake of the king's meat, not only got him the gold medal that he desired, but we remember him for a lot more, amen? Amen. Why? Because he just decided in this one area that the Lord's convicting me on, I'm not even arguing whether it's right or wrong. I'm saying the Lord's convicting me in this one area. He just wants this from me. I'm just going to take a stand because I know that's what the Lord wants. Everyone laughed at him. Everyone thought he was crazy. Everyone tried to convince him to do otherwise. You know what? The Lord looked not on the outside. See, we're Bible believers, King James Bible believers. We could go to the New Testament and show how he was doctrinally wrong and he didn't have to worry about keeping the Sabbath. Really? You think the Lord really cares about that? I mean, I know the doctrinal application, how it all applies. But I tell you what, the Lord wasn't anywhere near as interested in the doctrinal correctness of his stance as he was the heart of his stance. Don't misunderstand me. I am all for proper doctrine. You know me, right? Amen. I'm just saying, sometimes we as Bible believers, Bible, King James, Bible-believing Christians, sometimes we miss the important thing. The important thing is Daniel standing up saying, I purpose in my heart not to defile myself with the king's meat. And Lord, you're just going to have to take care of me because of it. If I starve here in, in Babylon, if I finish starving what I didn't starve in, uh, back in Jerusalem, so be it. But you know, that's not what happened to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says in verse 4, they were favored. Daniel and those three boys were favored. They were chosen out. 
Let me ask you this. Do you think that was the first time Eric had ever had to make a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ? I bet that was his regular habit. Do you think that was the first time Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ever had to take a stand for Jehovah? That was his regular habit. You know what the, you know what the joy is? When you set your heart to not being defiled, you become favored. The Lord says, ah, take a look at that guy. Take a look at that gal. They're setting their heart not to be defiled. It says a little bit later, they were fairer and fatter. Some of us like that one. <laughs> right? Now, what should have happened, right? Full-fledged meal versus salad? Come on. Right? They should have lost weight. No, the Lord took care of them. They set their heart not to be defiled, and the Lord took care of them. They were favored. They were fairer. They were fatter than all the other children. You say, what's the, what's the benefit of being undefiled? This is the benefit the Lord takes note. And then it says down at the end of the chapter that Daniel and his friends were found ten times better. Ten times better. Why? I'm going to purpose in my heart not to be defiled. And the end result is they were found ten times better. And I'm just saying, and we'll close, if that works for Daniel, as New Testament Christians, what do I do? I go to the Bible, I find out, okay, what things defile me as a New Testament Christian? And I'm going to take the same stand that Daniel took. Doesn't matter if I eat the king's meat or not, because I've been given liberty to eat it or not eat it. Doesn't matter. But when my heart takes the stand to not be defiled, the Lord takes notice, and I find favor, and I wind up fairer and fatter, and I wound up being found ten times better. I'm not a boastful thing. I'm just saying the Lord notices. And at the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be so thankful when you push yourself back from the king's table, the worldly king, the worldly king, you know what I'm talking about, and said, I just choose not to be defiled with the king's meat, whatever that is for you. I don't know what it is. Amen? Undefiled. The benefits of staying undefiled is you find favor, you're fairer and fatter, and you're found ten times better. Amen? That's a lofty goal. That's a lofty goal. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for a chance to just come back and take a look at some things in the Bible. Uh, Father, we appreciate uh, not only men in the Bible that took a stand for you and uh, we see how that you blessed and took care of them. But Father, we even have examples in our own lives, people that we know, people that we read about, people that we've uh, learned about in history that have taken a stand, and one thing has been consistent. Father, you have always taken care of them. You have always noticed it. And I'm sure the half hasn't been told of the rewards for just having a heart where we say, Lord, I just don't want to be defiled. I pray that you'd give us that kind of strength, that kind of tenacity in our Christian walk. Help us, Father, to live a life that is pleasing in your sight, that in a in a small measure, Father, our testimony in our life might one day, in some respects, be a monument to another Christian, maybe in our family, maybe our friends, but just might be a monument to somebody that stood firm and decided not to be defiled. I pray you'd help us to be that kind of Christian. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.